All right, so let's talk uh, about the Senate appropriations call for a government accountability office probe into the Navy's budget uh, tactic to deliberately underfund programs. This comes from USNI News. This is written by Mallory Shelbourne. Full credit to that organization and Mallory for writing a fantastic article about uh, this probe that looks like it's going to happen into this tactic. So what the Navy does is... It supports or it submits a report to Congress saying, hey, we need to have this many ships, this many submarines, airplanes, whatever, uh, to provide for the Navy and security of the nation for, you know, for naval engagements and whatnot. And on that list is two Arleigh Burks, you know, two Virginia class hypersonic funding, you know, weapon funding and all that stuff. But whenever the Navy submits their budget, like this year, for example, uh, they only had one Arleigh Burke on it. And uh, funding for I think it was two Virginia class and you know potentially a third uh, was was requested but not budgeted for. And so the Senate uh, says, well, you tell us you need this, and you submit a budget that doesn't meet it. So what the Senate has to do then is uh, have another vote to increase uh, the appropriations or the funding for the defense budget. And it looks as if this is all political, by the way. This is Kabuki theater that. They're going to, you know, increase the defense spending. The Senate is against the requested budget or in oppose in opposition to the requested budget of, uh, say, seven hundred and whatever, 30 billion dollars it was. And this year, for example, the Senate said, well, we need that second Arleigh Burke, just like you told us you need it. So here's an additional twenty three point nine billion dollars using the twenty twenty one twenty twenty two budget as an example. So it the Navy submitted their budget knowing that they were going to get additional funds from Congress to get that second Arleigh Burke, but they didn't want to look like they were the generals, the admirals, for whatever reason, didn't want to look like they were asking for a lot more money as if 730 some billion dollars isn't a lot of money. It is, uh, but they didn't, they knew that they could get more than what they were asking for. And it would make the senators look bad and the senators don't like looking bad. So the Senate's like, we're tired of this, because this goes on every year. This, this is not the first time this has happened. So finally, the sen senators are like, listen, call the GAO, get a, get a special in investigator to go look at the Navy's budgets tactic and their process and you know, get the Navy to ask uh, or budget for what they say that they need is, is what this is all about. It's, it's all politics. It's all about positioning. Uh, and, it's, and it's about you know, funding too in the end. Okay. With that preamble out of the way, now that you have that understanding of what we're talking about, let's read what Mallory writes from the piece. Senate appropriators are worried about the Navy's budget tactics and are calling upon the Government Accountability Office to conduct a study to address their concerns. The Senate Appropriations Committee wants to wants a comptroller general, <laughs> which is like an, a forensic uh, accountant investigator, uh, which leads the GAO, that's the Government Accountability Office, to uh, assess procedures, both the Navy and the Pentagon cost assessment and program evaluation CAPE use when planning for multi-year procurement contracts and provide a return to the lawmakers within three months of fiscal year 2022 uh, defense spending bill becoming a law. So they got you know, three months from then to, to submit this. So we'll get this early next year. According to the exploratory, explanatory statement, Accompanying the draft of the legislation, the statement language specifically raises concerns over how the Navy has handled this multi-year procurement deals in recent years. Quote, this report shall include an analysis of, of treatment of multi-year procurement funds for the Navy program in the fiscal year 2021, fiscal year 2022, uh, the president's budget submissions. The statement reads, uh, the language released this week uh, with the draft of fiscal year 2022 defense plan spending bill comes after the Navy's recent budget submission only asked for one Arleigh Burke destroyer instead of two that a part of the current multi-year procurement contract. Buying only one destroyer will break the contract. The Navy will incur a $30 million penalty. So that's the other side of this. I should have brought that up, but I'm, I'm glad Mallory did. This is why she's brilliant. Um, we have contracts with these shipyards saying, hey, you know, hire and train this workforce because we're going to be building two Arleigh Burks a year for the next multi-year procurement process. And so by, if we if Congress did not give them the additional money for that second Burke, they would have incurred a $33 million penalty. Um, 
supposedly so that they didn't lay off all those workers. But I got news for you. If if they don't need them, that shipyard will pocket that money and lay those workers off because I've seen that happen. Uh, but anyway, the point is, is that there is a significant monetary penalty that the shipyard gets to keep for not doing anything, for not building a destroyer. And so to avoid this penalty, they gave them the money for the second Arleigh Burke. And this is why the Senate's pissed. They should be pissed. The Navy needs to cut the shit out. Okay, the committee is concerned that this continues uh, a trend by the Navy to submit budgets to Congress that deliberately underfund programs deemed by the Navy to be critical. Because remember that report I told you about, they said they needed this. With the expectation that the Congress Appropriations Committee will restore funds to these programs within the budget allocation for the Department of Defense. They are calling them out for exactly what they're doing. Oh, and I'm glad they're doing this because these shenanigans are ridiculous. Anyway, back to the piece, quote, as a result, these repeated budgetary maneuvers, the committee questions whether the Navy's budget requests accurately reflect the service's most important priorities. These are particularly concerning given the Navy's plans to initiate and ramp up several major acquisition programs in the near term, including Columbia class submarines, uh, next generation air dominance family systems like DDGX and SSNX. Those are the next uh, submarine and destroyers coming out. At the same time, the Navy is struggling to manage costs on several major acquisition programs, including the Columbia class submarine, certain subsea and seabed warfare systems. Oh, I know. I know what those are. Uh, the Tau uh, fleet oiler uh, revealing significant cost increase for each of these uh, programs in the fiscal year 2022. So here's something that I've seen in the shipyard is um, and it's almost like a Ponzi scheme, which is scary, uh, but Projects will run out of money in the shipyard. It just happens. Uh, where the money goes, I don't know. But you have a bucket of money for, say, refitting and refueling a submarine, right? And you get, it's an 18-month program. You get to month 16, and we're just, wow, we're out of money. So where's the last two months to get the ship back to sea? Where's that money going to come from? Well, what a shipyard I've seen do is take money from a future project that hasn't started yet and use some of that money to finish this to meet the milestone that then unlocks the money for the next project or the next phase, whatever it is, because these are usually broken up into phases. But if you don't meet those milestones, you don't unlock the dollar bills to continue the refit process or the building process or whatever it is the shipyard's doing. And, um, and so that's like some clever accounting that they do here, uh, but it's also you know taking from Peter to pay Paul. Uh, and so it, it, by doing that, you're always behind. And that works as long as you're always getting new contracts to borrow or take money from to finish the one that you're working on now. That's kind of what's been going on here. That's a little bit of a different problem than what the Senate's pissed off about. But know that a lot of this accounting stuff uh, goes on all the time, whether it's at the Congress level or it's at the shipyard level. There's never enough money. Oh, this is a really cool picture. I tweeted this out this morning. Look at this. This is the USS Vermont um, being floated, I think, for the first time in 2019. And so this this goes back to where the shipyards, you know, who knows what money they needed to, uh, to get from a different project just to get to this point. Floating a submarine is one of those milestones that unlocks additional funds for pier side testing and other tests. But until they get to this part, they can't touch those dollar bills. Yeah, they're not supposed to anyway. Sometimes they do. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this is going on. It's all a political game. It's really boring. I don't blame you guys for your eyes glazing over on this. Think of it as musical chairs. You have the Pentagon and the admirals, and then you have the Congress that, you know, approves these huge $700, $739 billion budgets, right? And nobody wants to look bad. So by having this 24, you know, 0.7 billion dollar boost from the Senate, it looks as if the Senate is giving uh, additional more money than the military is requesting. And it gets reported like that. So senators look like they're spending money wastefully when in reality, you know, the real budget instead of being 739 billion is actually 778 billion. And they should have asked for that money in the first place. And so the music's playing. You got a limited number of chairs and everybody on the Senate wants to have a seat to protect their rear end when the music stops playing. And that's really what this is about. I, that, really, that sums it up so well that I really don't think we need to continue with this. Uh, there is, let's see, we got some names here. 
uh, Senator Appropriations Committee Vice Chairman Richard Shelby of uh, Alabama criticized the Democrats for releasing the series of funding the bills this week. Okay, uh, Senator Shelby says, uh, Chairman Leahy's decision to unilaterally unveil partisan spending bills is a significant step in the wrong direction. This one-sided process has resulted in bills that spend in excess of the Democrats' own budget resolution. And see, so here we go. We got two political parties using this accounting process to beat each other up in public. And that's why they don't like this. That's why they want to put a stop to this. That's why they're calling for a GAO probe into the Navy's budget tactics. Anyway, so that's a little bit about how American government works. It's a clusterfuck. It's a circus full of monkeys and barrels. And uh, I live here. It's great. <laughs> what do you guys think of this? Yeah, it's, uh, it's exactly. It's corruption. It's, it's terrible. It's, this is how the game is played. Yeah, face palms. You guys are right. I'm so disgusted. Oh, don't think that we're the only country that does this, by the way. But I'll call out the United States every time I see stuff like this because it, it's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. Uh, Derp says the government is a Charlie Foxtrot. You're absolutely right. Sounds like Congress has been doing with Social Security for 70 years. That's an interesting point to bring that up. I'm surprised Social Security is not bankrupt because whenever I was born and growing up in the 70s, they told me, do not plan on social security. And uh, I'm getting ready to collect it <laughs> a couple years from now. A GAO probe sounds painful. It is in many ways, you know, physically, accountingly. Yeah. Take a break after the Naval news section. Oh yeah. Yeah. We all, yeah, we, we always do. We always do. Okay. We got one more. Let's do it. I'm pressing on. We're pressing forward. All right. Here we go. Oh yeah. More good news. Fuck. All right, so the U, uh, this piece comes from Joseph Theravik from The War Zone, part of the drive.com uh, website. He writes, uh, the U.S. long-range hypersonic weapons test that they just had, I think it was like last week or over the weekend, it failed. Yeah, our hypersonic weapon doesn't work. Uh, the test appeared to set uh, aloft a hypersonic craft beyond the range of any existing known U.S. boost glide vehicle weapon in development. And then it failed. Joseph writes, details are still limited, but the Pentagon has confirmed that the U.S. military test today for a long-range hypersonic weapon from Alaska has failed. There are reports that the system being tested was a missile design that will be used as the U.S. Army's Dark Eagle or the U.S. Navy's intermittent range uh, conventional prop strike weapon. What a terrible name for a hypersonic glide weapon, but whatever. Uh, for the piece, but it's still uncertain as to this case considered whether the test took place uh, and an entirely separate booster stack or even a different hypersonic payload may have been used. And that's important because we're, we don't even know if the rocket got off the ground. So if they were using a new booster engine, well, then that's what failed. Um, we, we really don't know. Reuters was the first to report this. So credit to Reuters for the story, actually, even though Joseph wrote this article. So Reuters was first to report when uh, this test failed, which was conducted from the Pacific Spaceport Complex in Alaska on Kodiak Island in the state. Other outlets are now reporting many of the same uh, basic details, but exactly uh, what is being, what was being tested and how it failed remained unclear. Yeah, because like their statement is, is that uh, it failed to launch. Here it is. The booster rocket with the hypersonic glide body attached failed to launch today. So does that mean it the rocket never even fired? Or did it begin to fire and then fail? Anyway, either way, it didn't work. We know that. And uh, you remember I was talking about notices to mariners? So whenever you get uh, a notice to mariners, uh, you get little Latin long points like this here. And this is how we know about this, by the way. It's because they, they have to make this public. They're like, hey, uh, if you're fishing in the Atlantic or the Pacific, don't be standing here, here, or, or down here. And uh, that's because that's where these boosts, uh, if they work, are going to fall back to Earth. So you got, you know, initial launch here. <clears throat> and then you can just connect the dots, you know, to here. So something that's interesting about this notice to mar mariners or this navigational hazard, it's also called, is this point right here. Is this looks like because it's parabolic this is the ballistic phase of the expected launch when it works this is the hypersonic glide vehicle phase look at how short the hypersonic glide vehicle phase is to the ballistic phase so why is that important well 
the ballistic phase is parabolic. Parabolic is easy to calculate positions in the future. If you can do that, it's a little bit easier to shoot down if you can get a weapon up to it. So during this entire flight, if a, an adversary is watching this and wants to shoot it down, when the missiles here at Bravo, they can be calculating an intercept point at Charlie, launch the missile towards Charlie, and by the time the parabola gets to here, you have an intercept. So this is a bunch of vulnerability for our, our hypersonic glide vehicles. I imagined before seeing this graphic that the, that the boost phase was like between A and B, but that is certainly not the case. I expected the hypersonic glide vehicle to go thousands of miles, which supposedly it can do. But in this test, uh, clearly 70% of it is just parabolic ballistic uh, flight trajectory. That This is not advanced. This is some basic Mercury astronaut program uh, level of technology from the 50s. Uh, and then this is the new hotness right here. So, but it doesn't even matter because we didn't even get that far. So one thing about failed tests, uh, you can still learn a lot from a failed test. You learn one, what didn't work, and then how to make it better. So just because the test failed, it doesn't mean the whole program's useless. That's not the case at all. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm just saying that, uh, I just wanted to show that to you there. Uh, I've got that picture from here. Yeah, here it is. That's the picture there. Oh, and here's the notice to Mariners. If you, all these are little Latin long points right here. And so if you put all these and connect the dots, uh, you get these little areas. You get these little areas like this one and that one and that one and this one. Okay, so that's how that works. Let's go back to the piece and see what Joseph has to say. Uh, the distance between these launches impact points is significantly longer than the stated range of the common Army Navy hypersonic missile. So that implies that maybe this is a new booster that is very long range. The Army has only said that the past that the Dark Eagle, which is their version of the hypersonic glide weapon, uh, will be able to hit targets out to a distance greater than 1,700 miles away. The distance between Kodiak and the islands is 4,000 miles. So that's a significant range increase. Certainly, you would think that they'd be using a stronger booster and considering how long that boost phase is too. Uh, this failed test also notable because uh, after reports from China has tested a new fractional orbital bombardment system that uses hypersonic glide vehicles. Uh, news of the test first broke on Sunday uh, with a second report coming out yesterday that said China had conducted two tests uh, of this weapon system earlier this year. Wow. So they're going full fobs. So the fractional orbital bombardment system, guys, uh, that was something that the Russians fooled around with in uh, the, during the Cold War, and they stopped doing it. Keep this in mind, the Soviet Union stopped production and testing of the fractional orbital bombardment system because just testing it and having that capability was seen as too provocative, too likely to start a war. China's doing it, and they've already done it multiple times this year. China don't care. They are just doing whatever China wants to do. Oh, we have an update here. Okay, cool, cool. So uh, brand new update uh, on this. U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Tim Gorman, a Pentagon spokesperson, has provided the following statement regarding today's failed test. Uh, on October 21st, which is yesterday at the time of this recording, the Department of Defense conducted data collection experiment on the Pacific Spaceport Complex Alaska Kodiak AK and to inform the department's hypersonic technology development. The test did not occur as planned due to a failure in the booster stack. So, you know, something, it might have got off the pad, but it didn't get far. Uh, the booster stack used to test was not part of the hypersonic program and is not related to the hypersonic glide body. But it is a, definitely a new booster stack because look at the range. They're talking 4,000 miles now. You need to get that sorted out because that would be a great capability if they get it to work. Okay, program officials have initiated a review and to determine the cause of the booster system failure uh, to inform future tests. That's what I'm saying. You can learn a lot from a failure. So that's good that they're doing that. Experiments and tests, both successful and unsuccessful, are the backbone of developing highly complex critical technologies at a tremendous speed. And the department is doing hypersonic technologies. Developing hypersonic weapons remains the top priority. And the department remains confident that it is on track to field offensive hypersonic capabilities beginning in the early 2020s. China already has it. Russia claims to already have it. Uh, this flight test is part of an ongoing series of flight tests that we continue to develop this technology. Uh, oh, and there's another. Oh, look at Tyler down here. His little happy face. 
Second update is, uh, it has been brought to our attention that the failed test may be one of the known hypersonic flight test threes or FT threes. Okay, so Alex from um, Twitter said the FT three proposed action would consist of a, I can't read the whole thing. Do I need to click on it? Let's see, let's take a chance here, aha. Hypersonic flight test three, the US Army flight test proposed action would consist of a flight test designed to prove various aspects of launch vehicle and payload system capabilities. Proposed action FT3, launch from PSCA flight over the Pacific uh, BOA, payload impact at uh, the Islet or Islet. Uh, deep water impact zones are also analyzed, possible payload impact locations. Nothing really interesting here. FT3 is a flight test that would include base support, range safety, Okay, I don't know why that's important, but they added that to the update, so I thought I'd bring it to you. Oh, here we go. This is a really good picture. So like whenever uh, we were on board, you know, say submarines and we get notices to mariners, it's the quartermaster's responsibility to put it on the chart. And so whenever I would go on watch and go look at the chart, we would see little boxes like this. A lot of times if we're off the coast of Florida, anytime they're doing a rocket launch or they used to launch the space shuttle, we would have boxes like this. Here's where the boosters are gonna be. Uh, if they have to divert and come back to Earth, this is where they're gonna you know, land, so don't be in these boxes. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Anyway, so yeah, the test failed, but we're learning from the test. We should have hypersonic glide vehicle capability in the early 2000s. That sums it up. Still years behind potential adversaries. What do you guys think about this? They aimed short of the track and did not show the full range. Well, if that's not the full range, then that's pretty incredible. This is a huge distance. This is 4,000 miles, dude. I mean, these, these missiles aren't magic. You know, they don't, they don't just go forever. I mean, I'm not going to argue that they can't go farther, but they don't need to go any farther than that. 4,000 miles, plenty big. What I'm curious about is how long does it take to get there? That's what we don't know. I know these things are like, you know, Mach 5 plus, uh, but depending on altitude, Mach numbers change, you know. Ninja says, uh, my jaw's on the floor. It's shocking at how far this technology has come. Yeah, you're going to go blame uh, the backwardness of Kodiak. I've never been to Kodiak, so I don't even know what's on that island. I imagine a bunch of bears. <laughs> Certainly bears are there. Sundown, thank you for resubscribing for three months. Yeah, yeah, that's it for the Naval News today. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, this has been tough.